Hi everyone, Reverend Beth Simmons here with another midweek moment for you. I am outside this week, not because of noise in my house, uh, but just because it's so beautiful and I am soaking up this sun. After last week's, um, I think we had a solid, probably at least seven days of overcast skies. Um, the last four, five days of gorgeous sunshine has been so welcome. We have crossed over the line, uh, the, the quarter turn of our year. We have uh, crossed the midway point of winter and are headed for spring. Um, there's still plenty of snow out here at the moment. They did finally, we finally got our little uh, meeting house out on the ice for our ice out contest. Um, get those guesses in because I don't know how long the ice is going to be in this year. Because we, we, I think it's supposed to be warm this weekend. So it may be a very short ice in, ice out uh, season. And some of the bigger lakes um, here in New Hampshire, I know Lake Winnipesaukee is not made ice in yet um, and so may not because the sun uh, as we get in the next week or so is going to be warmer and stronger and so no matter how cold the days are the ice is just not going to form uh, enough but hopefully our little meeting house will will stick around for uh, for a while six weeks at least maybe um, I don't know that it's ever gone out um, in February before, at least not in, since they've tracked it. Um, but it certainly, I think, has gone out in March. So, so get those guesses in uh, if you need a ticket. Um, I think they have them at the Hancock Market and at Fiddleheads, or you can send a message to the church and someone will get back to you about how to get uh, get your guesses in for, for our Ice Out contest. Um, but this week, so this week I wanted to talk about children in the church. I am part of a, it's hard to say inter, it's more not really an interfaith family because um, part of my family it is not at all a part of any faith, really. Faith in humanity. So I guess if, if anything, um, that's our interfaith. But my two younger children do go to church with me. And, um, and I plan on keeping them with me at church as long as it works for all of us, as long as they're okay with it. And I know that there are other families who bring their kids to church and some families, uh, many whom, you know, their young adults don't go to church at the moment and yet they still are glad they decided to bring their kids to church. These are very open-minded folks and I don't think they're offended that their children <laughs> have chosen not to be part of a church at the moment in their young adulthood. Uh, but there's a question still, you know, I think as these young adults then go out and start having families, they might choose to not raise their children in church. And I had an interesting conversation, <coughs> excuse me, with someone whose child does not currently attend church <coughs> um, as a young adult, but plans on, um, <coughs> goodness, <coughs> plans on bringing any future children that they might have, uh, to raise them in a faith community. And I thought that was really wonderful. And because I know that there's a lot of families who maybe grew up at church, don't have a strong connection to their faith and want to give their, don't want to be dogmatic, don't want to force their kids into something. Maybe they were forced to go to church and they hated it and so they are not making their kids do that. They want to give their kids the choice. Um, the problem is that uh, the choice of going to, you know, when you're once you're a teenager and a young adult, walking into a church when you have not grown up into that uh, walking into a new church when you have grown up in church is intimidating. Walking into a faith community when you have no connection to that faith, you don't know the words, you don't know the rhythm, you don't know the, the you know, tradition, you have no idea what's going on. Very few people are going to choose to do that, on their, at least on their own, which is probably why a lot of people join new churches because they've been invited by someone they know and trust. So that's just a little side note there. Uh, but I wanted 
to just offer a few benefits. This is part one. I'm going to call this video part one of why bring your kids to church. This is how it benefits kids. And this is not uh, what's inter so, super interesting, by the way. Just a little side note here. I Googled that. I Googled the question. Why bring kids to church? The folks who are answering this question on the interwebs are not people that I share theolo theological beliefs with, which is interesting to me, right? Because maybe progressive Christians are not ans asking this question. <clears throat> maybe they're not answering this question. But, um, yeah, it didn't really jibe with my sense of faith and why I bring kids to church. So here's my three reasons to bring kids to church. Uh, first, intergenerational, intergenerational relationships. This is one of my favorite things about my kids being in church. And one of my favorite things about me growing up that I loved about growing up in the church I did not have grandparents who were particularly close by. One, I grew up in New Hampshire. One parent, grandparent was in Florida. The other set of grandparents was in Maine, three and a half hours away. And, you know, we're busy. We didn't get to see them that often. But I had these other adults in my life uh, who were my grandparents' age, some older than my grandparents, many younger than my grandparents, some the same age as my parents. And... I had relationships. I was able to cultivate relationships with them beyond my parents' relationship with them, if that makes sense. They were, in many ways, surrogate grandparents or just aunties and uncles. As a lot of cultures have this, right? These sort of you, all these adults in your life are aunties and uncles. And that's what it was for me. We even, there was one Sunday school teacher who we called Nana. Everybody, everybody called her Nana. She was, you know, and these are people that when I went away to boarding school, when I studied abroad in high school, they were writing me letters, keeping me in touch with me. I hope you're fine. One even sent me flowers over Christmas, but you know, they were, they were keeping in touch, following up with me. And I knew that they were people that I could reach out to if I had questions or concerns, but even just beyond that, on a Sunday morning at coffee hour, I could have conversations with adults in ways that many of my peers could not have. Because just like you don't speak to other kids outside your family in the same way you talk to your siblings, you don't talk to other adults in the same way you talk to your parents, when you are speaking with other adults outside of your family unit, you are learning different things than just talking to family members. <clears throat> or close friends who are sort of what we call now family, right? The, the friends of your family. Um, and I think that's so important for kids to be able to have this connection to other generations, to understand different perspectives uh, than just their peers, to, to look to other adults for guidance as mentors to see other folks who are traveling sort of the same road that you are that are not your parents. And, and I think that is so great. You know, my kids absolutely connect with and have conversations with like real conversations with the adults in our, the congregations that they've been a part of. And it's just, and that was part of one of the hardest parts of leaving our previous conversation or congregation was, um, was having to leave those relationships. But I think that's a really big part of why to bring your kids to church is to have these relationships with other adults of different generations who are outside of your family unit. unit. <clears throat> Number two sort of connects to that, which is that church provides a set of values and a moral compass that also goes beyond family values and your family unit. Every family has their own set of values, how they want their kids to live and engage with the world. At some point, though, kids are going to be seeking 
guidance and information beyond just what their parents and grandparents and cousins, whoever, whether it's just you, your little unit or a little wider unit, they're going to seek guidance beyond there. And to be able to have a set of values that many people are following, uh, a set of positive values that many people are following and wrestling with. And I think that's important to, uh, to show the wrestling, to ask the questions in front of the kids and, and seek answers. That is, and I think this is key to, to um, for adolescents in particular and keeping them engaged with a faith community is to acknowledge that though their parents may attend this faith community also and be part of this, that the the shared values are not always totally shared and um and they can be part of this wider community while still sort of doing the adolescent thing of rejecting their parents which is totally developmentally appropriate so that's number two all right and the third thing is that attending church regularly um so not not just Christmas, Easter, or like, you know, once a quarter or something, but on a regular basis, children are able to make connections in the same way adults do, by the way, that this is one of the big pluses for adults attending church regularly, between ancient stories and people and their modern lives. Kids can get stories and learn about things all kinds of ways. You can read books about stuff, but it's hard to find how we connect those stories to our current lives beyond a congregation in a church setting. <clears throat> because you can read the Bible, and you, but it, then it's like reading a history book. Um, when we don't make those connections, when we don't read, and, and the recognition also, I think, and this is this goes beyond Christianity to other older old faith traditions also you know and some are older than others clearly right judaism is older than christianity um is that there is a connection to our ancestors and again beyond our familial ancestors to a tradition an ancestral tradition that i think people don't don't value enough you know we want all the modern things and the progress and i get it you know but i think it's so important to at least have that foundation right you can't reject it if you don't even know it you can't you can't understand it if you don't know it you can't understand it understand it enough to reject it if you don't know it um and you can move forward and be progressive while still connecting to your ancestors and your traditions. And I think that's something. And again, it depends on the congregation, right? Not every congregation is going to have this aspect. But I'm thinking of the congregations that I know and I've been a part of and that I am that I have pastored. And that you are learning stories about people, about kids. Think about, you know, David. And Goliath. Now, I think it's important that, you know, you learn about David and Goliath. And then as you get a little older, you learn about David and other stuff that's not so celebratory or a good moral compass. <clears throat> you know, you got to have that, <laughs> that addition, you know, developmentally appropriate stuff. But connect to these stories of people who faced challenges, of people who made mistakes and were still loved. These ancient, ancient things so that kids can understand that when we're teaching them these familial values, these community values, that they're coming from an ancient place and an, are, are grounded, have a foundation in something that is much bigger and deeper than just what their parents are telling them and what they're you know the leaders and 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 heroes of today are saying 
that, you know, when they're looking at someone that, so say someone who from recent history, and I hesitate to call this history because so many people um, are so alive who were part, this is part of their life, uh, but say something, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., right? These kids, so many kids are not going to understand and hear in Dr. King's words, his faith, because they won't know it. And yet, if you have a kid growing up in church who hears the voices of the prophets, who hears the stories of Moses and of Exodus and of let my people go, and you know these stories that so informed Dr. King's messages and so informed the belief system that every person has value the belief system of nonviolence that is rooted in Jesus's teachings, you're going to miss a good chunk of what he says. So all of that is to say, if you are someone who considers yourself a Christian or open to Christianity, maybe you grew up in a, you know, in a Christian house or like, you know, we're sort of nominally Christian, um, and you're wondering, you're like, oh, maybe my kids will be bored. Maybe they will be bored. Maybe that's number four. It's okay for kids to be bored sometimes. <laughs> they can learn coping skills for how to do things that are not exciting and fun all the time. Um, but in your thinking of taking kids to church, take them to church. Start going to church. If you don't go to church, maybe start yourself first. Practice that. Or just learn all together. Hey, we're going to try this new thing and maybe set it for a time. Lent is coming up. It starts next week. <clears throat> next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Maybe you can learn together what Lent is, why you do Lent, and then spend Lent, the six weeks of Lent and leading up to Easter. Make that your Lenten practice. Bring your children to church. Go to church as a family if you're able to. You know, that's not something we do. My husband doesn't come to church with me and that's fine. But my kids do. Whenever they, whenever they are healthy enough, last week they missed because they, they were sick. We always protect our community also. Those intergenerational relationships mean that, you know, we try not to share our germs. Um, so that's part one. It's a very long winded part one. Um, and there is, but this is why it's going to split into two parts. Cause I've got other things to say. Part two will be, uh, why bring your kids to church benefits for the church community. All right, everyone. Enjoy this beautiful sunshine uh, or if, you know, whatever weather, wherever you are. And um, if you want to join us for a wonderful worship service Sunday, 945 a.m., we're going to uh, revisit Simeon and Anna and the presentation of Jesus and the temple this week before Lent. Uh, and two weeks from now, uh very special service is going to be brunch church in the vestry at a regular worship time, 945. And the small church leadership community will be serving breakfast as a, we're just going to do this uh, small experiment with radical intent to give everybody a little Sabbath and break. And we have connection and community and, uh, and feeding each other and eating together and just being in each other's company. So anyway, um, have a wonderful rest of your week and I love you. And so does God. Bye everyone.